David Bowie's death inspired worldwide mourning, but who remembers Rob Fisher of the new wave duo Naked Eyes? These 80s stars are also gone, but they shouldn't be forgotten. It didn't take long for French-Brazilian band Kaoma to reach global success. Known for 1989's sultry hit Lambada, Kaoma had sold 2 million albums by 1990. But Lambada didn't come without controversy. Two Bolivian brothers, Gonzalo and Ulysses Hermosa, sued Kaoma for using the melody of their own song, Llorando Se Fue, without crediting them. The Hermosa brothers won the suit, with 50% of the track's royalties going to EMI, the company that owned the original song rights. Lombana's sensual vocals belonged to Brazilian singer Loalva Braz. When the song blew up, Braz moved to Paris, where she lived for 10 years as she recorded and toured with the band. When she finally returned to Rio de Janeiro, Braz continued performing her hit at live concerts and events, but sadly, her life was cut short at the age of 63. In January 2017, Braz was found dead in a burnt car near her house in Saquarema. Initially, her cause of death was unknown, but it was later revealed that she was targeted by thieves in what was described as a robbery gone wrong. Irene Cara would have had an enviable career on stage and screen had she never even attempted a pop music career. Oh, that's me. She debuted on Broadway in 1967 at the tender age of eight in the musical Maggie Flynn. Off-Broadway television and feature roles followed throughout the 70s, including children's series The Electric Company and the 1976 film Sparkle. In 1980, Cara starred in the iconic feature film Fame, leading the ensemble cast and singing the theme song, which won an Academy Award. Next, in 1982, Cara released her debut solo album, Anyone Can See, but the best was yet to come. Later that year, she was tapped to co-write and perform the title track to the movie Flashdance, which scored yet another Oscar and shot to number one on the pop chart. Unfortunately, Cara's career was damaged by shady business practices on the part of her label. In 1985, she filed a lawsuit against Network Records, claiming that she'd been bilked out of royalties from the Flashdance soundtrack in her first two albums. She received a $1.5 million settlement in 1991, but later complained to People magazine that she had been, quote, virtually blacklisted as a result. Kara attempted a 2011 comeback with her group Hot Caramel, but the project went nowhere. Irene Kara died in 2022 from heart disease. Nick Kamen was always going to be some kind of star. On top of his magnetism and charisma, he was impossibly good-looking. The Englishman appeared in a famous 1985 Levi's ad that had him stripping down to his boxers in a laundromat while Marvin Gaye's version of I Heard It Through the Grapevine played in the background. It's been said that the ad caused sales of Levi's to shoot up by 800%. Kamen also had a pretty good singing voice, and since he happened to be hanging around New York in the 80s, he got noticed by Madonna, who gave him a song she'd been planning to record, Each Time You Break My Heart. She also sang backup on the track, which promptly sailed to number 5 on the US and UK charts. However, Kamen's previous high-profile career as a model didn't do anything for his longevity as a pop artist. Despite charting with a couple more hits in the UK and Italy, once again with an assist from Madonna, his pop fortune soon faded, but it didn't seem to bother him. Kamen spent his later years painting, practicing Buddhism, occasionally modeling, and hanging out with his significant other Lucinda Carey. In 2021, after a three-year cancer battle, Kamen died at 59. In a crowded field of 80s rockers, the outfield stood out for several reasons. A trio of British boys who chose a name associated with American baseball, the band rejected the popular hair metal style of the day in favor of straight-ahead pop-tinged rock. Thanks to their well-defined sound and their distinctive tenor of bassist and lead singer Tony Lewis, the outfield scored big with their debut LP, 1985's Play Deep. The album featured a pair of top 20 singles, including the number six hit Your Love, which still gets plenty of airplay on classic rock radio stations. The band had longevity, charting a total of eight Hot 100 singles through 1992, and they continued to record and perform until the 2014 death of guitarist keyboardist John Spinks from liver cancer. Lewis soldiered on, releasing a solo album in 2018 and an all-acoustic EP in 2020, but in October of that year, it was announced that the singer had died suddenly and unexpectedly at the age of 62. No cause of death was given. Given. Lewis was eulogized by his official ex, formerly known as Twitter, account in a moving post which read in part, He was a beautiful soul who touched so many lives with his love, his spirit, and his music. He loved his fans dearly and enjoyed every opportunity he had when meeting all of you. The definition of a blue-collar rocker, Eddie Money didn't look or sound like a rock star, but he more than made up for it in pure heart and charisma. Money first made a splash in the late 70s with the hits Baby Hold On and Two Tickets to Paradise, before courting major stardom with a pair of tunes in the early MTV era, Think I'm in Love, a number 16 hit, and Shaken, which, while only reaching number 63 on the chart, boasted a wildly popular video featuring Apollonia Cotero, who would go on to co-star with Prince in the 1984 classic Purple Rain. Money would really cash in later in the decade, releasing the number 4 smash Take Me Home Tonight, featuring legendary vocalist Ronnie Spector in 1986, and the number 9 hit Walk on Water in 1988. 
All told, he landed 23 singles in the Hot 100 during his career, and according to his website, he sold a whopping 28 million records. In 2018, Money and his family starred in the Axis TV reality show Real Money, which often chronicled the health struggles that would eventually become too much for the star. Money died in 2019 at the age of 70. Axis TV founder Mark Cuban paid tribute to the rocker in a statement, writing, He will be missed immensely by all of those who knew and loved him, but if we know Eddie, he's rocking right now in heaven, doing what he always loved. Bassist, vocalist, and songwriter John Wetton first made his mark as a member of 60s and 70s prog rock outfit King Crimson, recording three albums with them before they broke up in 1974. Wetton then floated around to a few other bands, including Roxy Music and Uriah Heep, before returning to his roots. Wetton convinced drummer Carl Palmer of Emerson, Lake & Palmer, guitarist Steve Howe of Yes, and keyboardist Jeff Downs of The Bugles to form Asia, a prog rock juggernaut that was his one shot at mainstream success. While the band certainly got proggy during stretches of its 1982 self-titled LP, it also got poppy enough to yield a pair of massive hits. The number 4 smash Heat of the Moment and Only Time Will Tell, which reached number 17. The band's follow-up, 1983's Alpha, produced the number 10 rocker Don't Cry, but after one more album, Wetton took a lengthy hiatus before reuniting with the band in 2008. Wetton and Asia scheduled a U.S. tour in 2017, but it was not to be. He died from colon cancer in January of that year. In 2023, many of his prog rock peers, including Downs and his Yes bandmate Rick Wakeman, participated in an all-star concert in his honor. Detroit vocalist Colonel Abrams, which was indeed his real name, had a brush with mega fame before becoming a star of dance and early house music in the 80s. During the 1970s, Abrams and his brother Morris were doing time in a soul group called Conservative Manor, which made some noise after a well-received performance at the Apollo Theater. Abrams went on to sing for 94 East, which featured a then-unknown musician with another title for a first name, Prince. That band soon went their separate ways, and Abrams embarked on a solo career. In an Associated Press interview in 1986, he reflected on that time, saying, I just look at that whole situation and shake my head. Because when I first met Prince, I said, this guy's gonna be great. The group was definitely tight. Abrams made his mark in the world of dance music by combining Motown-style R&B with more hard-edged sounds of rap coming out of New York, his adopted city. In 1984, he scored a hit on the international dance charts with Music is the Answer, which landed him a major label deal. He went on to record more dance floor classics, including I'm Not Gonna Let You, How Soon We Forget, and his biggest hit, Trapped. Unfortunately, Abrams' later years were marred by hardship. He was unhoused and struggled with medical bills for years before his death in 2016. It's easy to forget that Chicago rockers Survivor were far from a one-hit wonder, but when your introduction to the national scene is a tune as indelible as Eye of the Tiger, you take the bad with the good. That song from the Rocky III soundtrack spent six weeks at number one on the pop charts and made instant stars of the band. They went on to arguably greater success afterward, landing four singles in the top ten in 1985 and 1986. But not long after Eye of the Tiger went nuclear, the band ditched lead singer Dave Bickler in favor of a new voice, Jamie Jameson. The tribe has spoken. Jameson had previously fronted the band Cobra and sang backing vocals for the likes of Joe Walsh and ZZ Top. Jameson sang lead on all of Survivor's successive hits, including High On You, Is This Love, The Search Is Over, and, from the Rocky IV soundtrack, the number two hit Burning Heart, which was perhaps his best performance. The band's commercial fortunes ended when the 80s did. Their final hit single, Across the Miles, peaked at number 74 in February 1989. Survivor continued to perform together and were kicking around in the studio and coming up with new material when Jameson suddenly passed away from a hemorrhagic brain stroke in 2014. He was 63 years old. Australia's Divinals took their native country by storm before coming to the U.S., but it took them a while to take off stateside. While their 80s output was marked by just one minor hit single, Pleasure and Pain, which peaked at number 76 in 1985, the band was a critical darling thanks in large part to the skills of guitarist and songwriter Mark McEntee and uber-charismatic lead singer Chrissy Amphlett. For nearly two decades, Chrissy Amphlett was the wild woman of Australian rock. With just one Australian top 10 single under their belts, 1981's Boys in Town, the band landed a record deal with Chrysalis Records, releasing their debut LP Desperate in 1983. They released two more albums in the 80s, and while the band scored big with critics, they had a tough time getting their feet under them commercially due to their tendency to keep losing managers, not to mention bandmates not named McEntee or Amphlett. Their biggest hit came in 1990 with the risque number four single I Touch Myself from their self-titled fourth album. But later in the 90s, the band slipped off the radar, and in 2010, Amplet revealed that she had multiple sclerosis, which was complicating her treatment for breast cancer. You know, being I that diagnosis... I had MS. I was going to get cancer. Wasn't that enough? 
She told the Sydney Morning Herald, It's unfair, but life is not fair. Even rock stars get breast cancer. I'll get over it. I've got songs to sing. I've got stages to perform on. I'm a keep on going sort of girl. Sadly, that was not to be. Amphlett died due to complications from breast cancer in April 2013 at the age of 53. Warrant got in on the very tail end of the 80s hair metal craze, but did they ever capitalize? Their debut album, Dirty, Rotten, Filthy, Stinking Rich, released in 1989, went double platinum and notched three hit singles, Down Boys, Sometimes She Cries, and the smash power ballad Heaven, which climbed all the way to number two. Their success was due in large part to the talents of frontman Janie Lane, whose voice was made for the genre and whose blonde locks and good looks made him a natural fit for music videos. Warren's second LP, Cherry Pie, duplicated that success, spawning a pair of number 10 hits, including the title track. But in the early 90s, grunge and alternative rock took over and Warren's fortunes declined, although they continued to perform and record. Lane left Warren in 1993, but returned for several stints with the band. In the interim, he dabbled in television and briefly joined his fellow hair metalers Great White for their 25th anniversary tour. Unfortunately, like many of his peers, Lane struggled with drugs and alcohol for years. In August 2011, Lane was found dead of alcohol poisoning in a hotel in the Woodland Hills area of Los Angeles. He was only 47. Vocalist Tina Marie was a mainstay of the 80s R&B charts, and she had a voice that was made for the genre. A high and clear soprano capable of crooning, belting, and sliding up and down the scale with effortless ease. After spending years in development at Motown and briefly partnering with Rick James, Marie was having trouble breaking through to the pop charts. That's when she did something that may define her legacy even more than her music. Early in the 80s, Marie filed suit against Motown for non-payment of royalties and won. The case changed California law, which thereafter discouraged labels from keeping artists under exclusive contracts. Freed from Motown, Marie signed with Epic, where she finally had mainstream success with 1984's number 4 hit Lover Girl. Marie had a number of R&B hits throughout the 80s and took time off to raise her daughter in the 90s before returning to music with an unlikely partner, Cash Money Records, the rap label that was home to such artists as Birdman and Lil Wayne. The same people refused us. Today, wish they would have signed us. They regret every minute of it. Her first album for Cash Money, Ladonia, cracked the top 10 on both the R&B and pop album charts, and one of its singles, I'm Still in Love, earned Marie her third Grammy nomination. Marie died from natural causes in 2010 at the age of 54. As an artist, Paul Davis was tough to put into a box. His voice was soulful, yet possessed an unmistakable southern twang, and with his penchant for smooth keyboards and balladry, it wouldn't be on a line to classify his breakthrough single as yacht rock. That single was 1977's I Go Crazy, a number seven hit that remained on the chart for a record-setting 40 weeks. Davis went on to even bigger success in the 80s with the hits 65 Love Affair and Cool Night. I, when I quit trying to write hit songs years ago and started writing with feeling, that's when I started being successful. Davis then pivoted to country, scoring hits via duets with Marie Osmond and Tanya Tucker. But as his career was starting to wane, Davis was shot during an attempted robbery, prompting him to step away from public life and concentrate on songwriting in his home studio. In the aughts, he was working on new stuff and considering a return to recording. But in April 2008, Davis suffered a heart attack and died in the hospital in his hometown of Meridian, Mississippi. It was the day after his 60th birthday. Blue-eyed soul singer Robert Palmer has been described as pop music's answer to James Bond, and the descriptor couldn't be more fitting. Suave and smooth, and often dressed in formal attire, his very British manner and good looks had a way of obscuring his singularly amazing voice, which was as capable of astonishing power as it was a seductive croon. While he scored a few respectable singles in the 70s, including 1979's classic top 20 hit Bad Case of Loving You, Dr. Doctor, Palmer became a massive star with his 1985 LP Riptide and its pair of ginormous hits, both propelled by iconic music videos, Addicted to Love, which spent two weeks at number one, and I Didn't Mean to Turn You On, which peaked at number two. Even as these tunes were climbing the charts, Palmer joined supergroup Power Station, named after the legendary recording studio. The group featured chic powerhouse Tony Thompson on drums and John and Andy Taylor of Duran Duran on bass and lead guitar, respectively. Power Station released a pair of top 10 singles, Some Like It Hot and the T-Rex cover Get It On, Bang A Gong. Palmer kept the hit train rolling with Simply Irresistible, which peaked at number two in 1988. While his commercial fortunes waned after the 80s, Palmer continued to record until the end of his life, which came far too soon. In 2003, he suffered a fatal heart attack. He was only 54. Eddie Rabbit made a name for himself as a songwriter before finding success as a solo artist. From East Orange, New Jersey, Here's Eddie Rabbit. After signing with a Nashville publisher in 1968, he wrote or co-wrote hits for the likes of Elvis Presley and Ronnie Millsap, parlaying that success into a recording contract in the mid-70s. Rabbit enjoyed moderate success on the country charts in the latter half of that decade, but as the 80s dawned, a funny thing happened. 
mainstream audiences began to take notice of his distinctive voice, and with his disciplined pop and form songwriting, he became one of the few country artists to score massive crossover hits early in the new decade. A pair of singles from Rabbit's 1980 LP Horizon lit up the charts. Driving My Life Away peaked at number five that fall, and its follow up, I Love a Rainy Night, fared even better, spending two weeks at number one in early 1981. Rabbit continued rolling with his next LP, Step by Step, hitting number five with the title track, and he lodged another top ten single with You and I, a duet with Crystal Gale but that would mark the end of his streak of pop stardom. A couple of tunes cracked the country charts in the late 80s and early 90s, but within a few years, Rabbit was diagnosed with a lung cancer that would eventually take his life. After treatments, including surgery to remove part of a lung in 1997, Rabbit died in 1998. He was 56. The impact of British duo Naked Eyes on the pop chart was brief, but anyone who was around during the salad days of MTV in the early 80s likely remembers them well and fondly. Composed of vocalist Pete Byrne and keyboardist Rob Fisher, the pair's 1983 self-titled debut cracked the top 40 on the US album charts and yielded a pair of singles that get plenty of airplay even today. Always Something There to Remind Me, a number 8 hit co-written by the legendary Burt Bacharach, and Promises Promises, a funky dancing number that peaked at number 11. Unfortunately, the band couldn't follow up that success. Their sophomore LP, 1984's Fuel for the Fire, struggled to number 84 on the album charts, with its lead single What in the Name of Love just cracking the top 40. That album would be the band's last. Fisher went on to form another duo, Climey Fisher, with vocalist Simon Climey, but that project went nowhere. After playing keys on tunes by artists such as Rick Astley and Jules Shear, Fisher was ready to take another crack at working with his old pal Byrne, but it was too late. After years of serious illness, Fisher died in 1999 of surgical complications. He was 42 years old. Rockers' Ario Speedwagon were active throughout the 70s, but despite respectable album sales, they failed to have significant success with their singles until the 80s, when the floodgates opened. Behind the talents of frontman Kevin Cronin and guitarist Gary Richrath, the Speedwagon finally broke through with their 1980 LP High End Fidelity, which featured the number one smash Keep On Loving You. Throughout the 80s, Speedwagon scored a staggering 14 Hot 100 singles, including a second number one, 1985's iconic I Can't Fight This Feeling, which spent three weeks in the top spot. After the 80s, the band largely cooled their heels, releasing compilations of their hits and denying rumors of bad blood between Cronin and Richrath. The door has always been open to Gary. Well, yes, I want to if you want to do it in the right way. Despite apparently clearing the air on that topic on a 2001 episode of the VH1 series Behind the Music, Richrath had left the band by the time they released their next LP, 2007's Find Your Own Way Home. Richrath never returned to REO, but his legacy within its ranks is more than secure. He wrote several of their biggest hits, including Keep On Loving You and Take It On The Run, and Cronin himself credited the band's mainstream success to him. In 2015, Richrath died while being treated for an undisclosed illness. He was 65 years old. There were punk rock acts like The Clash, there were shock rock acts like Alice Cooper, and then there was The Plasmatics. The band, led by frontwoman Wendy O. Williams, were something else entirely, purveyors of loud, destructive, gender-bending musical theater that were just as likely to drag chainsaws and sledgehammers on stage as they were drums and guitars. Williams' stage presence was always provocative, often belligerent, and at times partially nude. Throughout the band's 80s run, she was slapped with multiple obscenity charges, and the band was known to destroy not only their instruments, but also television sets, consumer electronics, and even Cadillacs. The Plasmatics released several LPs, including New Hope for the Wretched and Beyond the Valley of 1984, but their Gonzo live shows were the band's focus. And they were so completely, consistently off the rails that on the one hand, they were banned from performing in Britain, and on the other, they sold out New York's legendary Palladium without a major record contract, something no other band had ever done. I just want to be known as the heaviest woman in heavy metal. In the late 80s, Williams continued with a solo project produced by Gene Simmons of KISS, one final Plasmatics record titled Maggots the Record, and even a rap-themed album, before retiring in 1988. A decade later, at the home she shared with former manager and partner Rod Swenson, she died by suicide. Swenson indicated that she had long had difficulty adjusting to life outside of music, and that she had planned her death for some time. Williams was 48 years old. The run of Hard Rocker's rap was confined almost entirely to the 80s, but what a run it was. Behind the growl of frontman Stephen Percy and twin lead guitars Robin Crosby and Warren Demartini, the band followed up their self-released self-titled debut by signing with Atlantic Records and dropping Out of the Cellar. It was a triple platinum smash that yielded the top 20 MTV hit Round and Round. The band's audience was dedicated, 
While it didn't achieve the highs of Out of the Cellar, three more Rat albums released in the 80s also sold north of a million copies each. Unfortunately, Crosby was privately dealing with serious health issues. In a 2001 interview with a Los Angeles radio station, he revealed that he'd contracted HIV years before, due to substance abuse during Rat's heyday in the 80s. Crosby said, I have full-blown AIDS. Basically, it's killing me. I've been in the hospital for eight straight months and in and out for over seven years. In June 2002, Crosby died of a heroin overdose at the age of 42. Speaking with the San Diego Union Tribune, Rat's hometown newspaper, Crosby's brother-in-law Bill Decker said, Fame was the worst thing that ever happened to Robin, and it was his downfall. The heroin got in the way, and the cocaine, and all the other stuff. At some point, he just gave up. If you or anyone you know needs help with addiction issues, help is available. Visit the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration website, or contact SAMHSA's National Helpline at 1-800-662-HELP-4357.